8.5. I'm going to try and teach it to you in concise a way as I possibly can. A lot of the skills that we're going to be talking about in this section, you already know. The only difference is we're going to be using synthetic division to help us get to a point that uh, we can then use the quadratic formula again. Remember the quadratic formula? You thought it was gone, but it's not. All right, we're going to start with the fundamental theorem of algebra. This is a theorem that was first proven uh, by the guy on the poster over there in red, jo Johann Carl Friedrich Gauss. He actually proved it for his first PhD, and he ended up proving it several different ways uh, over the course of his life. But basically what it says is the degree of your polynomial tells you how many zeros or x-intercepts your graph has, okay? It's pretty easy. Bear, your butt out, right? Who else has got him in in my class, okay? If you're in, if you're in Garcia's class, maybe he allows you. Okay, so whatever the degree is, that tells you how many zeros you have. And that could include what's called multiplicities, okay? So if we look at example one, <clears throat> it's a third degree polynomial, yes or no? Is that what makes it the degree? No, no, no. This is not written in standard form, so you got to be careful. We can start shuffling terms around. If I wrote this in descending order, negative 2x to the fifth plus x cubed plus 17x minus 13, the degree of the polynomial is what? 5, okay? The fundamental theorem of algebra basically just tells you then you're going to have five x-intercepts. You're going to have five solutions. You're going to have five roots. You're going to have five zeros. That's how you know when to quit searching for them. Now, those zeros can be different types of zeros. Here are the types of zeros that we have. Types of zeros. We have, we have real, which can be of two types. They could be rational, which means that they're fractions or integers, or they could be irrational, which means they're going to have radicals, like the square root of 2, the square root of 3, the square root of 4. Those are the two types. Or, if they're not real, they could be what? Yeah, we studied imaginary, okay? And that's going to be like with I. They're going to have I in them, okay? Um, if they are real, they're going to be uh, one of three types, okay? We're going to have three types. Um, let, let's see what this graph looks like before we get into the three different types and what they look like. Let's go ahead and graph this. It says use the fundamental theorem of algebra and the corollary to determine the number of zeros, okay? So we're just going to answer this question. It's degree five. So here's the answer to the first question. So there are five zeros, and that's the answer to this question. That's all we have to do with it. Now, I just lost my calculator. I was just a little bit too late getting it timed out. Let me reload it. All right, let's take a look at this graph of this function. Uh, if you type it into y1, and you're welcome to grab a yellow one up there, or you can use the one from Minnesota, negative 2x to the fifth, carrot five, make sure you click to the right, plus x to the third, click to the right, um, plus 17x minus 13. Okay, and if we hit zoom six, which is our standing window, it looks like that. Um, how many x-intercepts do we actually see? If you count how many times it crosses the x-axis, it looks like it crosses three times, right? It looks like it crosses three times. Here's what's going to happen. If we see only three real x-intercepts, three real x-intercepts, and the fundamental theorem of uh, algebra sorry, tells you that there's five of them and only three of them are real, how many does that leave left over? Two. Guess what type they have to be if they're not real? There's going to be two imaginary solutions. And today what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to find all the reals, and we're going to learn how to find all the imaginaries until they add up to the degree of the polynomial, and then we stop looking for them, okay? Now, if they are real, they're going to be one of three types. There's, there's three different uh, types, and it's called multiplicity. Multiplicity. You have, first thing, what's called a single root. A single root is just like the ones that you see on the graph over here to the right. The graph crosses the x-axis. It almost looks like a line. 
It's like a straight line almost that just crosses the x-axis. They're single roots, okay? We call these multiplicity one. Multiplicity one, or M1 for short, okay? They, they, they account for a single x-intercept. Here's what the factor looks like. The factor for a multiplicity one would look like this. It would look like x minus a to the first power. If you ever see a factor that's to the first power, that means that its root is a single root. It's an M1 root, and graphically, it's just going to cross the x-axis. And those are the only types that we've seen this year so far. Okay, so now we're getting into the new types. The second type of real root that you might see is a double root. A double root has multiplicity 2, or we'll just say M2. I'm not going to write out multiplicity every time, but it's an M2 root. And what this one looks like, it has a parabola shape on the x-axis. So this one crosses. It shoots straight across. A parabola shape is what I call a bounce. Okay, it bounces off the x-axis or it bounces from above or below, but it bounces off the x-axis. Okay, um, what that's going to look like, because we don't see a picture of that, that's going to look something like this. It's going to be kind of like x squared. It's going to bounce, boing, off the x-axis, and it could be from above or it can bounce from below. That's going to be a multiplicity 2 root. Let's go ahead and draw a picture here since the, the graph will go away. But that's going to be right there. That's an M1. It just shoots across. Okay, so we've got a cross as an M1. We're used to seeing those. And now we've got this new type. If it bounces, kind of like x squared, uh, it's going to be a double root. You're going to recognize the, the, the factor in the equation for a double root by just looking at the exponent. So if you have a, if you have a double root, you have a double factor, and it would be like our perfect square trinomials that we talked about earlier in the year, x minus a quantity squared. If you see an exponent of 2, that root, in this case a, by the factor theorem, is a double root. It's a balance on the graph. Okay. And then the last one that we're responsible for here, a double root. This was a triple root. And a triple root is going to look something like this. It's going to come in like it's going to bounce. It's going to approach like it's going to bounce. But instead of like continuing downward, if a bounce happens, it goes saik and it curves upward like that. Or it could actually approach like this and go downward like that. Okay. I call this a, a wiggle. But really what it is, it's an inflection point is the proper name. But it's fun just to say wiggle sometimes. It's where the graph wiggles. So if you ever have a graph wiggling across the x-axis, this is going to be an M3, a multiplicity 3 root. And the factor, of course, as you can imagine, now is going to look like this, x minus a to the third power. Okay. So what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to recognize them graphically. Is it crossing? Is it bouncing? Is it wiggling? And we also want to be able to recognize them from the equation. What's the exponent on the factor? Is it a 1? Is it a 2? Is it a 3? But notice that the multiplicity itself, M1, exponent of 1. Multiplicity 2, exponent of 2. M3, multiplicity of 3. They match up. The exponent on the factor is the multiplicity of that root. Okay? All right. Let's try out example 2 now. Uh, use the graphing calculator to sketch it and identify the roots and state the multiplicity and then write it in factored form. So what's the degree of this polynomial? It's degree six. It's already written in standard form. So how many how many roots are we going to have? We're going to have six roots. They can be real. They can be imaginary. They could be rational. They could be irrational. They could be double roots. They could be triple roots. They could be single roots. We're not sure. The graph will give us a lot of information. So let's go ahead and go back to the graph, or we haven't seen the graph yet, but back to the calculator. Clear that one out and type this one in carefully. X caret 6, click to the right. Minus X caret 5, click to the right. Minus 11, X to the fourth, click to the right. Plus 13, X to the third power, click to the right. Plus 26X squared. That doesn't have to be clicked to the right. Minus 20X. Minus 24. Boy, that's, that's some work just getting that typed in correctly. Yeah. Double check, triple check. Did I do it right? Did y'all do it right? Looks good. And then we hit Zoom 6. That's your standard viewing window. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little bit here. I'm going to show you a cool way that we could zoom in without having to manually 
Change your X min, X max, your Y min, Y max. Hit the zoom button up there on the top middle. And go down to number um, well, number one, zoom box, zoom box. So it's zoom number one. Hit enter. You're going to get a blinking cursor at the origin. Click up and to the left. What you're going to do is you're going to put that in the top left corner of a box that you're going to want to zoom in on. Okay, so I'm just going to go to the top left of where that first x-intercept is, somewhere right around there. Okay, now hit enter, and you'll establish the upper left-hand corner of a box. Now what you could do is you could scroll to the right, and you're creating the width of the box, and or at the same time, you could scroll down, creating the height of the box. So you could do them kind of in sequence. You could do one, then the other, and you can play around with it, but you're clicking right and down, right and down, right and down. And I'm going to make this box cover all the way to that other x-intercept somewhere in there and notice my box is not that tall i want to stretch this graph out vertically so what's cool about zoom box is it'll rescale to, to your your graphing window whatever the scale of this box is so once you establish that bottom right hand corner go ahead and hit enter and it'll it'll zoom in now notice i think i can see what the graph looks like let's go ahead and sketch the graph on our on our on our iPad. It looks like it crosses what what would be that first x intercept? Can you tell? If you're counting by numbers, one, two. You can hit the trace button now if you want. It looks like it's at negative three to me. Does it look like negative three to y'all? If you count the, the tick marks, one, two, three. It is negative three. So I'm gonna come over here, negative one, negative two, negative three, and I'm gonna put a dot. And then there's another one at negative one. And then it looks like there's one over here at two. So it looks like those are three x-intercepts. Now, what is the graph doing there? Well, the first one looks like it's just crossing. See that? It's not doing anything fancy. It's darting across, almost like a vertical line. The second one is narrow, but it looks like it's doing what at negative one? It looks like it's bouncing, and it is. And that third one, does that third one look like a cross? Or is it kind of wiggling there? It's wiggling, right? It's not shooting straight across like a line. It's curving across. It's wiggling. So we're going to draw that like it's approaching the bounce like that. And then we go psych and we head up. So the cross is your M1. The bounce is your M2. And the wiggle is your M3. So here's what we could do. We could say then that the, the roots are going to be X uh, epsilon if you want to write it in roster notation, you could say negative 3 and then parentheses M1, and then you could say negative 1 parentheses M2, and then you could say 2 parentheses M3, and then you can close the, the brace. Now notice I only see three x-intercepts, right? There's only three numbers where this graph touches or crosses the x-axis. The fundamental theorem of algebra tells us there's how many roots? Six, and I only see three. What happened to the other three? Are they imaginary? Possibly, possibly. But let's think about what it means to be a multiplicity of two. It means to be a double root, which means it counts as two roots. The reason it counts as two roots is because instead of bouncing there, it could just as easily has cr have crossed it and come back down, which would have had two x-intercepts, right? The triple root counts as three roots because it could have crossed, crossed, and crossed, but it didn't, okay? So that's why it, it takes up, it accounts for three of them. So have we really accounted for all six of them then? The single root counts once, the double root counts twice, so that's really three of them now, and that third x value counts for three of them, which is the other three, which puts us at six, right? So what the fundamental theorem of algebra tells us is if you have a polynomial of degree n, you're going to have n roots with multiplicities. So a double root counts for two of them and a triple root counts for three of them. So I've accounted for all of them. In fact, look what happens here. What happens if you add up the multiplicities? Add up the multiplicities. What do you get? Yeah, you get six. You get one plus two plus three which equals six. The sum of the multiplicities, let's write that here. The sum 
of the multiplicities is the degree of the polynomial. Ah, so that's how you know that you're not going to be looking for any more. So does this graph have any imaginary solutions? Nope, it doesn't. The theorem tells us we've, we've accounted for all six, so there's no more to be found, real or imaginary. We're done. Now, once we know the roots, remember, we can write the factors. So let's go ahead and write P of X in factored form. If negative 3 is a root, what's the corresponding factor? X plus 3. Remember that from yesterday? If negative 3 is a root, X plus 3, the opposite value, is a factor. Now, because it's an M1, its exponent is 1. Next one. If negative 1 is a root, what's the corresponding factor? X plus 1. And because it's a multiplicity 2 double root, guess what the exponent is? 2. And then finally, if 2 is a root, what's the corresponding factor? X minus 2. We've already known that. But now what we know today, what we're learning is that, oh, because it's a triple root, guess what its exponent is? 3. Now, one last question here. What's the sum of the exponents? 1 plus 2 plus 3 also equals what? 6. It's the same thing. If the exponents are the multiplicities and the multiplicities are the exponents, then the sum of the exponents should be the sum of the multiplicities and they both give you the degree. So here would be the function in factored form. So there's two different answers here. The roots, if you just want to list them, if you just want to list the roots, there they are with the multiplicities listed behind them. And if you want to put it in factored form, there is the function in factored form. It's not only fun, it's easy, right? It's fun easy. So this little picture right here that I drew, this is kind of something you might want to keep coming back to. I'm going to get rid of the, the highlighted part that shows you that it could have been a double root, it could have been a triple root. That right there gives you everything you need to know graphically about your multiplicities. The one is a cross. Maybe we can write something on there. This is a cross. This is a bounce. And this is a wiggle. And that's it. There are multiplicities of 4 and 5 and 6 and 7, but you're not responsible for those. A multiplicity of 4 looks a lot like a bounce, but it's hard to tell. A multiplicity of 5 looks a lot like a wiggle but it's hard to tell. But one, two, and three are easy to distinguish from each other. Okay, that's the first part of today's lesson. Questions so far? Multiplicities. All right, the second part of today's lesson is the rational root theorem, okay? There's three theorems left to go today. The rational root theorem is a way to get a list of candidates. It gives a candidate list it gives a candidate list for rational roots, okay? First of all, we need to know what a rational number is. A rational number is of the form P over Q. A rational number is of the form P over Q. Here are some examples of a rational number. Two over three, negative four over seven, even 5 is a rational number because I can write that as 5 over 1. Okay, so all of your rational numbers are basically your fractions and your integers. These, these are your relatively nice solutions. A fraction is still a relatively nice solution. There's no radicals, in other words. These are rational numbers. They can be expressed as a ratio of two integers. Now, there is a way to list the possible rational roots or zeros of a function, um, and it's the rational root theorem. Here's what it says. Your possible rational zeros are going to be a factor of the constant over a factor of the leading coefficient. Okay, good to know. A factor of the constant over a factor of the leading coefficient. Good to know. Let's try it out. Example three. Use the rational root theorem to find the rational roots. Okay, so looking at P of X, what's the, uh, what's the degree of the polynomial? 3. This is degree 3, so that means it's going to have 3 roots. If they're not real, they're imaginary. If they're not imaginary, they're real. If they are real, they could be rational or irrational. 
I'm interested in the rational roots, the fractions or the integers. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to list our P value and our Q value, okay? P is going to be negative 6. It's your constant. Q is 2, the leading coefficient. And I always write P on the top and Q on the bottom because that's how they are in the, in the quotient. So it's factors of your constant over factors of your leading coefficient. Now, let's just list the factors of negative 6. It's plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 6. We always want to consider plus and minus because if, if 6 is a factor, so is negative 6. Are there any other factors of 6 that I forgot to mention here? 1 and 6, right? What are others? Any others? Ah, 2 and 3. So plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3. And I think that's about it. So if you think about it, 1, 6, 2, and 3, and negative 1, negative 6, negative 2, and negative 3. That's 8 factors of negative 6. Would you agree? There's 8 factors of negative 6. 4 positive, 4 negative. And then for 2, it's just plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2. Once we have them listed out like this, constant factors on top, leading coefficient factors on the bottom, we're going to list the ratios P over Q. And it's almost like we're distributing. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take every number in the top and put them over the first number in the bottom. Okay, so here's what it's going to look like. Plus or, oops, not with the highlighter though. Plus or minus one over one. You don't need to put a plus or minus in the top and the bottom. The numbers that we generate are either positive or negative. So I'll just put them in the top. Plus or minus one over one. Plus or minus six over one. Plus or minus two over one. Plus or minus three over one. Okay, that's taking all of the top row and putting them over one. And now we'll do the same thing with uh, the, the two. So now we take all of these and we put them over two. So now we get, we get plus or minus one over two, plus or minus six over two, plus or minus two over two, and then plus or minus three over two. Everyone see what I did? And then if we had more, we would just keep going in the same fashion. This lists all the combinations of the top numbers over the bottom numbers. Now, let's go through and simplify these, okay? Anything divided by 1 is itself. So we really have plus or minus 1, plus or minus 6, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 3, all right? The next one we have is plus or minus a half. Now look at the next one, 6 over 2. What does 6 over 2 simplify to? Three. Don't we already have plus or minus three listed? Yeah, we do. So this is a repeat. We don't have to write it twice. And then I got plus or minus two over two. What does that simplify to? One. Don't I already have one listed? Yeah, that's another repeater. We don't need to list it twice. The next one is plus or minus three over two. I don't have that one yet. So there they are all simplified. So let's count them. I have one, two, three, four, five, six positive plus six negative. For a total of 12 possible rational roots. Now, in the days before calculators, if I wanted to know if any of those actually were roots, because it doesn't mean there's no guarantee that any of these work. It could be that all of these don't work. None of them work. And all of the roots are either imaginary or irrational. But if I wanted to know if any of these did work and I didn't have a calculator, how could I test these out rather quickly to see if they were actual zeros? Remember that question on your homework last night where it says, which one of these is a factor of the polynomial? And you had to go through and do some, you don't remember that one, Anastasia? And you had to go through and you had to try out the answer choices using synthetic substitution? How would we know if we did synthetic substitution if it was actually a root? What would we get for the remainder? We would get a zero, right? So. Back in the days before graphing calculators, the, the math students before y'all would have to sit here and now do synthetic substitution up to 12 times to see if they got a zero trying out each of one of these one at a time. And if they, if they got one, great. If they didn't get one, they could cross it off the list, and there was no guarantee that any of them worked. We're going to do something a little bit better than that. We're going to combine the old with the new. We're going to let the calculator give us a hint as to which of these, if any, are actually going to be uh, solutions. So let's go to the calculator here. Y equals, get rid of that six degree dude right there, and let's type in this cubic polynomial. 2x to the third, 
2x to the third, click to the right, minus x squared, minus 13x, minus 6, okay? I'm going to hit zoom 6, and there it is. Now, let's go from left to right. What does that leftmost x-intercept look like if you count by tick marks here? It looks like it's negative 2, right? Is negative 2 in our candidate list? It sure is. It's right there. So it's going to be negative 2, I'm guessing. What about that next intercept, the first one to the left of the y-axis? It looks like it's crossing between 0 and negative 1. Could it be negative 1 third? Could that be crossing right there at negative 1 third? No way, no how. Why not, Carson? Not in our candidate list. Negative one third is not in our candidate list. What number is in our candidate list that looks like it could be that number? One half, not one half, but negative one half, right? Ne it looks like it's negative one half, and that's in our candidate list. But it can be negative a third. It can be negative two thirds. It can be negative 0.7. None of those are in our candidate list. And then what's that next x intercept on the right hand side look like it's going to be? One, two, three. It looks like it's three. Is three in our candidate list? It sure is. Now, what does the multiplicity of each of those roots look like? One, two, or three. Are those crosses, bounces, or wiggles? Aren't those just shooting across? So they're all M1s. They're all M1s. And if I see three distinct x-intercepts and the degree is three, they're all going to be M1s. Yeah. They're all crosses. There's no bouncing or wiggling going on. Now, here's how we're going to verify it, okay? We're not going to try all 12 of them. We're just going to try the three of them that we suspect work. So let's come off to the side here, and let's write the coefficients of our polynomial in descending order of degree. 2x cubed, negative 1x squared, negative 13x, and negative 6. Okay, now here's the deal. We're going to do synthetic division with each of these in succession. I'll show you what that means here in a second. Does it matter which one we start with? I suspect it's going to be negative 2, negative 1 half, and 3. Does it matter which one we start with, if they're all factors, if they're all roots? No. So which one do you want to start with, the negative, the positive, or the fraction? What would be the easiest one? It rhymes with rosative. Positive. There you go. It really doesn't matter. I'm going to start with positive 3, okay? There's positive 3. Remember the process from yesterday. We bring down the 2. We multiply to get 6. We add to get 5. We multiply to get 15. We subtract to get 2. We multiply to get 6. And not surprisingly, we get 0. Not surprisingly, we get 0. We were suspecting 0, weren't we? Now, here's what's cool. We're left with the following. We know P of X for sure, then, is X minus 3 times, and remember, these are the coefficients of your quotient. So that's 2x squared plus 5x plus 2. Any factor that's still a factor of p of x is going to be a factor of 2x squared plus 5x plus 2. So watch this. When we try out the other ones, we don't have to go back to the original set of numbers. We can just now repeat the process using the numbers that are left over from the previous process. In other words, I have one fewer columns now to worry about. So we got the three taken care of. Which one would be e the next easiest, negative two or negative a half? Negative two. So we're going to synthetically divide with negative two on the result from the previous iteration, okay? Bring down the two, multiply, we get negative four. Five minus four is one. You multiply to get negative two, and guess what we get now again? We get a zero. Is that surprising? Or should it be surprising? It should not be surprising. Now we get to do it one more time. We draw a line underneath those two, and we synthetically divide with negative a half. We'll save the fraction for the end. Bring down the two. You multiply, you get negative one. And what do we get for our remainder? Zero. Yeah. Now, when you get down to a single number at the very end, this number ends up being your leading coefficient. Do you remember when I showed you how to get prime factorization by upside-down birthday cake? Remember when I showed you all that? 
This looks a lot like upside down birthday cake, but for polynomials. You know why? Because it is, right? So here's what we could do now. We could say P of X is going to end up being X minus 3 times X plus 2 times X plus 1 half. And then we got to put our leading coefficient in the front. So let me scoot this over a little bit. We'll put our 2 in the front. And there's the prime factorization of P of X. X minus each of those numbers we synthetically divided with, and then the leading coefficient out front. That's pretty cool. So all three of our roots were M1s. They were all to the first power, and they were all real. Now, there's another way to write this. Some people don't like having the X plus a one-half there. So if we took, if we took the 2 and distributed it into the third factor, we get X minus 3 times X plus 2 times 2x plus 1. That's another way to write it. Some people don't like having the x plus a half. Ooh, gross. You don't know where that finger's been. All right. Speaking of fingers, I think Mr. Garcia is not here if, if you're his kids because I, I think his son broke his finger. Speaking of fingers, be careful when you're picking your nose. You can get after it too much. Damage your finger. All right. Any questions on the rational root theorem? It's a way to list things to find possible rational roots. Okay. Now, what if the roots are not rational? What if none of these 12 things work? Okay. What other types of numbers do we have besides rational numbers? We have irrational numbers. And we've seen this already this year. Remember, irrational roots are like the square root of 2, the square root of 3, the square root of 6, the square root of 17. Anything that's an irreducible radical is an irrational number. And what do you remember about these things? They come in what? They come in pairs, okay? So you're going to have A plus or minus the square root of B. They come in conjugate pairs, actually. They come in conjugate pairs. So if a plus the square root of b is a root, a minus the square root of b is a root. You change the sign of the radical piece, okay? These are still going to be real x-intercepts. You're still going to see them bounce, cross, or wiggle on the x-axis, but they have to occur in pairs. So true or false, you can have an odd number of irrational solutions. True or false? False, because they have to come in what? Pairs. There has to be an even number of them. Okay. There will always be an even number of them. Now, if they're not irrational and they're not rational, then they're not real. They must be what? Imaginary. And we've already talked about complex roots this, this year. Imaginary solutions also come in pairs. A plus or minus BI. A plus or minus bi. It's built right into the quadratic formula. Negative b plus or minus the square root of something. Okay? True or false? Imaginary solutions have to come in pairs. True or false? True. Yeah. True or false? You can have an odd number of imaginary solutions. False. They have to be come in pairs. Okay? So you have to have an even number again. Let's review imaginary solutions. Use the rational root theorem. This is the last one of the day. Use the rational root theorem to list all the possible rational solutions and then solve it. Find all the roots. Okay. What's the degree of our polynomial that's set equal to zero? Four. So it's a degree four. So how many roots are we going to have? We're going to have four roots. They can all be real. They can all be imaginary, can't they? And they can also occur in multiplicities. Multiplicity one, two, or three. Let's go ahead and list the possible rational solutions. We have our P's, we have our Q's. The P is negative four, and the Q is three, your leading coefficient. Factors of four are plus or minus one, plus or minus four. I like to list them in factor pairs, and then plus or minus two. Factors of three are plus or minus one and plus or minus three. That's it. So here's our combinations of P over Q if we list them out. We'll do this. If you want to draw the little line there again, you can do it like that. So we'll have plus or minus 1 over 1. Let's see if we can simplify as we go this time. 
Plus or minus one over one is plus or minus one. Plus or minus four over one is plus or minus four. Plus or minus two over one is plus or minus two. So that takes care of those. And then we'll do all of those over three. So then we'll have plus or minus one third, plus or minus four thirds, and plus or minus two thirds. It's important that you're taking constants over coefficients. Constants over leading coefficients, not the other way around. Division is not commutative. So make sure that your constants are the top and your leading coefficients are on the bottom. So these are all unique. So one, two, three, four, five, six times two, we have 12 possibles again. All right, now instead of trying all 12 of them out, which I know you probably want to do, right? Let's just try all 12 and see if they work. We're gonna use the calculator to tip us off. So go back to Y equals, clear out that guy and type in the new guy. Three X to the fourth, click to the right, minus seven X to the third, click to the right, plus six X minus four. All right, and then we hit zoom six. Oh, interesting. Interesting. How many real x-intercepts do you see? Two, but I know there's supposed to be four roots, right? What do the multiplicities of those two real ones look like? Do they look like they're crossing, bouncing, or wiggling? They're just crossing. So they're both m1s. So there's two roots, and they each count as single roots. That only gives us two real roots, but we're supposed to have four roots. So guess what type the other two must be if they're not real? Imaginary. Yeah. That's what all that wiggling off the x-axis, that's what's taking those imaginary roots. You can't see them on the real number line. Okay? If we only see two real roots, the other two are imaginary. Now, let's see if we can figure out what those two are, the two real roots. What does the one on the left look like? X equals negative what? One. And it's an M1. Is that in our candidate list? Negative one? It is. What does the next one look like? Two, M1, is that in our candidate list? Yes, okay, so we're gonna do synthetic division now. Here's where the new stuff kicks in. We're gonna write out our coefficients in descending order, and remember, we have to have a placeholder for any missing power of X. So, we got three X to the fourth, negative seven X cubed, what comes next? Zero X squared, six X, and negative four. All right, we draw our line and we put our little box out front. We can put the box at the end. Which one do you want to do first? You want to do negative one or two? It doesn't matter. We'll do two since y'all said two. Okay, bring down the three. Multiply, you get six. Add, you get negative one. Multiply, you get negative two. Add negative two. That's negative two. That's four. That's going to be four, and that's zero. Not surprising that's zero. Now, again, the power of the synthetic division is we can keep dividing out our result. So we don't have to keep going back to the top. So I'm going to draw another horizontal line underneath there. And I'm going to synthetically divide with the other number, negative 1. All right, so bring down the 3 now again, and you get negative 3. Add, you get negative 4. 4 minus 2 is 2. Uh-oh. Did we do that right? 3, negative 3, negative 4, 4. 4 minus 2 is 2. What should be a 2? Oh, six minus. Negative two times two is, yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. Two times negative two, that should be a, yeah. Two times negative two is negative four. Six minus four is two. Two times two is four. Yeah, that's why it wasn't working. Okay, so I made a little careless mistake, and it, was, it wasn't working. So. What you want to do is if, if you force it because you, you're expecting a zero, you're going to get the wrong number. So if you make a careless mistake because you're doing your synthetic division too fast, uh, you got to go back and catch it. So it's best just to do it right the first time. That gives us negative two, which does give us zero. Okay. Good eye there, uh, Sergeant. All right. Um, now, here's what we're left with. This is what we're left with. If we started with X to the fourth, we divide it out once to get x to the third. We divide it out again. These must be the coefficients of what? x squared, since we divide it out twice. So this is 3x squared minus 4x plus 2. And now we want to solve that. So now it's like a brand new problem. We have a quadratic trinomial. It's equal to 0. We're going to try and solve it by 
Factoring. Does it factor? Does it double bubble, though? We could try, and you know what? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. But you know what will work every time for a quadratic? Oh. The quadratic formula. Yeah, baby. Yeah, let's go for it. It's the opposite of B, which is positive 4, plus or minus the square root of B squared, which is 16, minus 4 times A times C, all over 2A, which is 2 times 3. If we carefully simplify this, we get the square root of 16 minus 24, that's negative 8, all over 6. Now, let's come off to the side and think about the square root of negative 8. First of all, that's going to be the square root of 8 times I, if you recall. You take the negative out and put the I on the outside. And 8 is the same as 4 times 2. And the square root of 4 is 2, so that's 2 square root of 2 times I. So this becomes 4 plus or minus 2 square root of 2 I all over 6. Well, I can put them each over 6 then. And now I just simplify and I get 2 thirds plus the square root of 2 over 3 times I plus or minus. And those are my two complex conjugate imaginary solutions. So here are the total solutions. So the solutions are going to be x epsilon. We got the two real ones from above. We got the two and negative one. And then we got these two complex conjugate. And they're all multiplicity of one. There's four distinct roots, two real, two imaginary. And the degree is 4, so they all have to be multiplicity ones. And there it is. All right, we have a three-day break now for you to go home and practice this over three days, right? Which means when you get back on Tuesday, we will start by going through this summary right here. And I'll give you a warm-up that's very similar to this, okay? But you have enough information, if you want, to, to, to knock out your, your worksheet for this section, okay? All right. A full day today, but we, pr we pretty much got through the whole thing. Any questions? Thank you for paying attention, those of you who are in Mr. Garcia's class. I hope you learned something. If, if, if not, just be careful picking your nose. <laughs>